Good afternoon and welcome to this week's Career Talk. And I am delighted to be joined by Jonathan Cowie, the COO at Vivid Housing. Now, um, Jonathan, you and I have known each other for quite a while, but um, I don't know if you know this, but it was a chat with you around about 18 months ago that where the uh, idea of our Connect event series came out. Um, it was your idea. Um, I was inspired by it. And we've been delivering the Connect event series all year as our way to get our members out and about connecting with, with each other. But Brilliant. during that conversation, you gave me so many ideas and so many, many things to think about um, when I was relatively new in my role here at the CCMA. But I now want to turn the tables round and I want to now find out a little bit more about you, um, your career, um, what led you to being the COO at v Vivid Housing, um, and and really the, the, the aim of the next 30 minutes is through sharing your story to be able to provide some inspiration to those that are maybe new to the contact centre, thinking about coming into the contact centre, um, or maybe they're in a, a senior position already and they're thinking, you know, where do I go from here? How can I develop my career further. Um, but before I ask you about your current Love role, this cool, thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, now, before I ask you about your current role, I want to ask you about your education, because you're fairly well educated. You've got a degree from Manchester in European history, which is fascinating, fascinating. Um, you've got an MBA from the Open University, and you've got a certificate in leadership. Uh, from Glasgow. Why have you got all of those pieces of education, which I support, by the way, but why have you, you done that? So, um, uh, great, great question, Lee. I think probably to start off with, um, I, I'm not massively academic. And I think it's, uh, you know, there's, uh, I, I have come to quite strong views that I think some of the school and education system, I think, is, is great uh, for me that the, the personal driver has been really curious and I want to constantly learn. So early in my career, it was very much around kind of taking that knowledge through the school system, uh, going on to do a degree. Uh, when I was working in telecoms, uh, I was really intrigued how everything fitted together. How does how does a company work? And so the drive to do the MBA wasn't really about the qualification. It was very much about the learning of how does stuff work? How do you how do different departments work? How do those different elements come together to create kind of a, a really good organisation? Um, so, so my educational stuff really has been driven by, uh, by that learning. Um, what I found was I, I've got an older sister who was very academic and I was always in awe, uh, frankly, of, of kind of her. And so I never felt quite as good as, as she was academically. And so part of the learning I had was uh, actually was about the, the, the inquisitiveness to learn, but it was about the drive just to kind of go and see things, see how it works, see things, how, how things happen. So for me, it's not been about driving for the qualification. It's actually been just for the learning and the and the, the curiosity. That, do you know what? That's really interesting. I, I think the the um, when you're in a senior role like like you're in now, um, I think that need to understand business and and not just necessarily your 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 route to where you are, but that broader. Um, you know what what else? You know product development. How does that work? How does finance yeah. work? How does marketing work? Um, how does HR work? I think getting that that broader base of an understanding, I think, can really help to, to develop your career. So, go yeah. on. Just, just, on, well, I just, just reflect actually on your question. And, and I think there's a really interesting thing between, you know, and I think that I would encourage anyone to, to you know, to, to develop themselves as much and as far as they can. Uh, and if that's through the qualification route, fantastic. But interestingly, I was talking, I had a, an opportunity about two years ago to, we had two placements for two students at school. One was at sixth form, first year at sixth form. And the other was, was about um, probably halfway through the high school. And uh, they were coming to see how our organisation as a housing association works. And what stood out for me was someone who was kind of at the qualified route and, and was quite academic. Um, but actually, the person that was still going through the process, uh, it was her attitude. It was her inquisitiveness. It was the energy. And if I looked at the two individuals, it was that that I said would make would be what I would look for. So, so for me personally, when I'm looking at people who've, you know, actually what I also look for hugely in people uh, in terms of, of when I'm recruiting is that is that inquisitiveness, 
that hunger for wanting to, to improve uh, how we do things, how they do things, uh, and also just that outlook, uh, I think, is, is hugely important. And that is a big debate, isn't it? Do you go for a qualified, um, you're looking for someone that's qualified in X, Y, Z, or do you look for someone that has um, got more experience behind them? And, and I think you're spot on. It's actually the attitude. And, and that seems to come out um, in the conversations that I have around this. Um, I do support a qualification route, but you can't do that without experience. And, and you can have loads of qualifications, but if you haven't got the right attitude, then you might not get employed. Do you think your education has supported you through your career? Do you think it's opened doors for you? Um, I think it's enabled me to be able to compete uh, for for kind of as, at that entry level, certainly kind of you know early in my career. So it, it allowed mm. me to be able to go for particular types of roles or positions. I think as I've gone on, uh, I wouldn't say it's been a critical part, um, other than if it's something that I feel has added to my skill set which in turn has led me to, to, to do something. So again, for me, it's not been around the qualifications that's been important, but it's what I've learned through that, uh, through that programme or, or activity and how I've applied it. So for me, that's, that's probably more important. And, and we'll explore your experience um, in a moment, but you've, you've got the right attitude. You know, you've, um, your approach to work is one that, that people want in their organisations. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right that um, you might have the attitude and you might have the experience, but an education, the educational side of things, a degree or, or, or a certificate in, in a specialism can, like you say, really help you compete. Yeah. So yeah. No, I, I like that. I like that. So um, let's just reflect on what your role is today um, before we dive into your history and, and uh, hear where you, where you went when you came out of university. So tell us what being a COO at a housing association means. What, what does that mean? Yeah, what, what do we do? So, so um, uh, as Chief Operating Officer, I'm responsible for really for kind of the day-to-day -day running of the, of the services for the organisation. So we, as a housing association, we manage about 35,000 homes. Uh, that ranges from homes that we may sell to market rent. Uh, through to social uh, housing, so which is the bulk of what we do. And that also means we house some of the most uh, vulnerable in society. So um, day to day, I guess the best way to look at it, if, if, if something has gone wrong, it's usually my fault uh, in terms of that kind of end to end service. And I think two very different aspects uh, that, that I, I look at. So one is how do we make sure the homes that people live in are, are at the right standard? We do the repairs on time, etc. Etc. But it's also very much around how we have a take contact centre. We have one of the most complex services. So my job really is to make sure that day to day people are safe and secure in the home uh, and they can live the life you know, in, in the way they want to. Do you know what? Um, you, you and I could have a um, whole conversation right now around some of the challenges that your customers are facing. Um, and I would like to have that conversation, but but maybe for another time, because um, I'm sure that your job right now must be um, challenging enough, um, having just been through the pandemic, but then looking at all of the um, the rising cost of living, fuel prices, etc. And I, I guess you're you're looking at the next six months, um, I, I guess, with a little bit of intrepidation because you're not sure what's just how it might become. Um, but also, I guess there's a real opportunity for you to be able to help people. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're absolutely right, Lee. I, I think, you know, everyone's facing, um, I think, the, the challenge of in, inflating costs. And it's not just our customers, you know, our staff, our frontline teams in, in, in our contact centres, in our um, trades teams that go out and do repairs, are all facing, you know, some similar, you know, some of the same challenges as our customers. And so we're, we're kind of looking to say, what is it we can do to help, um, A, uh, make sure everything in the home, you know, our homes are as fuel efficient as possible, we've got the best insulation, how do we accelerate some of those things, through to um, the connections we'll have in the communities, where do we signpost, how, how, how customers and colleagues, pounds can go further with things like uh, food pantries, uh, through to we, we run a service for our customers, which is about are they able to claim or, or know what grants are available or, or claim relevant ben benefits, as the case may be. And, you know, we've helped customers find initial five million pounds of income in the last uh, in the last 12 months. So so those are kind of some of the things we're just looking at. How do we accelerate some of that, really? 
uh, and especially looking to the autumn when uh, fuel bills are expected to go up again, you know, people are now making some really difficult decisions. So, so I think we've got a, an opportunity as a, as a landlord to help kind of signpost uh, where, where to go to, to get help as well. Now, and that must be really rewarding. Uh, let's roll back um, to the start of your career. So you um, mentioned just now you've been in financial services, you've been in telecoms, you've been in energy and um, utilities. Um, where did you start out? Have you always been in contact centres? So, um, yeah, so uh, I think um, probably I'd, I'd say I'm a service professional, so I've worked irrespective of the sector. It's always been about kind of how service works in an organisation. Uh, I initially joined the army, actually, and uh, wanted to, thought that's what I was going to do for my, for my career. Uh, decided, actually, because I was always inquisitive and wanted to know how stuff worked. And, and, and for me, a big driver is how do you make something better? How do you improve it? If it needs improving. And of course, in the military, you can't really challenge that. So I thought that's probably not the long term career. So so coming out of the army, I went into contact centres. So, so I started so how, my career. In, how long were you in the army? How long were you in so the army? For, yeah, so I did that for three years. Um, and, and again, one of the things which I think resonates with contact centres and why people you know, go into the service world and, and often start in contact centres, it's that desire to help people or to serve. And certainly in, in the army, there's a phrase called serve to lead, lead to serve. And I found that's been true uh, as I went through the military, but then through the whole of my uh, sort of career, especially with a service focus, you know, you're there to, to lead, but you're serving both the people that you work with and, and you're serving the community or the customers that you operate uh, with as an organisation. So, so I think the strong resonance between the two. But so I, I came into uh, to contact centres uh, initially on the creation, I worked for a company called Mercury Communications and it was launching a big contact centre. So I joined right at the start, uh, did quite a few different roles there. So I started off actually in training and in the support side, uh, then moved over as a team leader, and then as a contact centre manager and then a general manager. And, um, you know, for me, I think, again, it was understanding all the different dynamics of contact centres and the services from repairs to sales to billing. Uh, from how Erlang C works uh, in terms of the whole planning piece and really how, you know, how a contact centre actually operates. Um, and I think one of the things that, um, again, stayed with me uh, through my career, contact centres are a fantastic grounding because you deal with really difficult situations. And one minute you're a coach, the next minute you're problem solving, the next minute you're dealing with some really angry and difficult situations. And so the behaviour skills that I think you learn both on the front line in a contact centre and in leadership in contact centres are, I find, are applicable for every senior role. So as I become exec directors from COO to CEO, uh, then actually those skills were really, really important that I, I've learned through the contact centre environment. I, I couldn't agree more. It's one of the things that... Um that uh, I feel is is one of our missions here at the CCMA is to is to prove if you're in the contact centre, if you've had experience working in a contact centre, yeah. then my goodness, the skills you get, the understanding you get is um, just second to none. Now, you mentioned that you, you um, when you were in training, um, became a team leader. You also mentioned that you went from contact centre to general uh, manager to general manager. What was the difference between those two roles? Yeah, so I, I think it, it was broadening out the, the people responsibility. I think, you know, if I, if I reflect, reflect back and look at the role as a team leader or in my role as an exec director, the activities, the seven or eight things you do are pretty much the same. The only difference is you're spending more time in different aspects of them. So I think, you know, if you're in that frontline team leader, that first line role uh, as a manager is the most difficult place to work because you've got grief coming up, you've got grief coming down uh, and you're not fully in control of everything and you're managing performance. And so in that kind of that, as you go through, then become a general manager or as a director, you're then spending, in my view, it's then more around spending more time on how are things working? So it's not just about the day to day performance management. Have I got the right skills in place for what we need today? Looking ahead for the next one, two, three years. What are the things? How is it going to evolve and change? What skills do we need in the team to do that? Uh, what are the what are the strategies we need in place to support some of those things? Um, and then secondly, I found um, the other big thing is is listening more and getting out and speaking to, to different teams more rather than doing the doing day to day. So it's the balance 
uh, to me between those things. So as a general manager, you might be running multi-site. Uh, and so it's it's really this, this, have I got the right strategy? Have I got the right people in place? And and really, have I got the finger on the pulse? What's really going on? So, you, you've, you know, now I still get out half a day a week, uh, go and listen to calls. I'll go out with our frontline trades teams, walk the estates of our neighbourhood teams, uh, or talk to people around, around the office and just tell me what's going on, what's good, what's bad, what's what's causing the pain. Interesting. So you cut your teeth in contact centres at Mercury um, Telecoms. Um, yeah. So so great grounding. What? Where did you go next? So, um, so I probably did in total. I did about twenty years uh, within the telecoms uh, and utility space. So, uh, I worked for BT, uh, worked for uh, Cape and Wireless. I then sort of uh, also moved to an international role. So I had contact centres in. Uh, it sounds very glamorous when I explain. So it has contact centres kind of operating in in the US, uh, over in California, uh, Munich, in Paris, in um, uh, India, and then through to Hong Kong. Wow. So. Uh, and yes, you do get to spend time out with those, uh, which is great, you know, fantastic experience. Um, and so for me, uh, what I was interested in doing was learning back to that learning piece. Do I understand how every part of service works? And so uh, from the contact centers, from repairs to strategy, uh, I run BT's uh, online customer services uh, and help create kind of really the first kind of service team as, as uh, self-service started to kind of really take off. Um, and in each of them, it's been a, a great learning journey, if I'm honest, because, again, you go in and I'm, I'm interested to know how does it work today? How can you make it better? And how does it connect to those other services? So as a COO, you know, I cover every aspect of the service. And I think I've, I've been involved or run individual departments through my career. So at least I have an understanding about how they work and what's important, um, really, and then in order to best coach and support uh, kind of my my team, uh, you know, at least having been there and done done some of those same things. So interestingly, you you rolled off a number of countries just there that you were running um, operations in. Um, other than and and um, people that are maybe going through their career and thinking, do you know what, I'd really like to do that. Other than the challenge of living out of a suitcase. What what was the other challenge with that? So we, you know we can we can bring out all the great stuff of seeing different places around the world, meeting loads of different cultures, all that. But what was the challenge of managing so many different areas? So I think there's probably two for me actually. Um, one is is making sure you understand the culture. So each country does have its own style, its own way of working, its own uh, belief systems, and so. I think it's really important to spend time to understand how they're different. So yeah. there are, uh, having run a contact centre in Northern Ireland, um, you know, there are particular things locally that are really important. You have to be really aware of um, through to through to India. Uh, so I think culturally get, get to know and understand those local flavours, those local customs, because they're really important in, in understanding how people operate and how people work. Um, I think the second challenge I personally found was when you're operating in different time zones, it's how to actually manage your inbox because you're getting emails every time of the day. And therefore, you've got to kind of be quite disciplined or set up a structure that, that allows you to figure out the best way to deal with the US when their emails are coming in versus India when they're coming in or Hong Kong. So for me, it was just that operating on that as a team operates 24 seven. How do you as a leader try and manage that? So some of that really was just about setting some rules about when I would and wouldn't be answering things versus connecting teams and, and how often we came together as, as kind of different countries uh, to and, and, and similar to people how people will be using teams, of course, through the pandemic more and more. It's, it's, it's that regular communication and just making sure we can everyone knows uh, what's going on. So what were the rules that you set and do and you still abide by them a little bit now? I do, actually. So, so I think there's something around... Um, because again, you know, it's the shadow you create. So if I'm answering emails eight o'clock at night uh, and firing them off, is the expectation for your team that they're there to answer them? And I'm sure we've all been in that situation where the bosses email me, should I respond tonight or do it tomorrow? So I think there's something around setting some rules that say, you know, um, I choose to, to operate by doing this or on a Sunday night, whenever it might be, because that's my choice to do so. I don't expect a response. 
uh, people are on holiday, they're on holiday. So, so for me, I think it's about as a team setting really clear ground rules about how you work, when you work, when something might be an emergency versus when no, actually, it's just BAU. Uh, and and I think it's how you set those collectively as a team. And I still do that uh, that today. I think it's still really important in any team you go into, or as people join the team, you're able to kind of just connect and decide as a team how those uh, how those rules work. Interesting. That's really interesting. Now, that role of having responsibility for an international footprint is very different to the role you have now. What happened in between? So how to go from one to the other. So actually, to your, to your point, I was living in a suitcase. Um, uh, social housing wasn't, uh, or moving into the housing sector, wasn't something I'd planned. Uh, it had, I'd been broached. Um, and it was at the time I had uh, two sons, and uh, they were uh, quite a bit younger. And um, it was uh, being away uh, quite a lot. Uh, then we said, well, actually, why don't I look for something that's, that's a little bit more UK centric, uh, where you're operating kind of in the same place, I guess, see my two sons. So, uh, so, so the opportunity came to bring four housing associations together to create one, uh, which is down in uh, uh, sort of down to Berkshire, kind of Wiltshire, part of the UK. Uh, and so um, that's how I came into the sector. And um, uh, initially wasn't sure that was kind of the sector for me. And, and what it opened my eyes to was uh, as a housing sector in its own right, it's a very, very big sector. There are 1,700 housing associations. Uh, you know, some of the bigger organisations manage, uh, you know, hundreds of millions uh, or a billion of turnover. So these aren't small organisations uh, and they have social purpose. So, so we're a commercial organisation, but with a social purpose and mission, which is about providing more homes, uh, more affordable homes. Uh, and so um, coming from a service world, uh, it resonated really strongly from a value perspective because I spent my survey, my career wanting to kind of improve the service the organisation delivers. Well, here I can do it, but actually it's a social business. So for every pound of profit we make, it goes straight back into to building more homes and back into our services. So, so, so that resonated and uh, I've now been in the housing sector for about 12 years. Wow. And do you know what? I'm going to touch on something you said there because... Um, there's a lot of talk uh, around the opportunities that are available for women. And yep. if you've got a family um, or you choose to have a family, um, then does that mean that you hit glass ceilings or all, all of this kind of stuff? But the way you described um, what you've been through, um, it was actually the, your family environment that made the decision as to your career yeah. choices. Hugely. So, so if I look at what I've, what I've you know, there, there are two or three things career wise I'm really proud of. Um, but actually, it's my family, which I'm most proud of. And so that's uh, certainly for me, that's that's a big drive. I don't think you can, comp you know, it, people will make everyone makes their own decisions, of course, and their own priorities. But for me, my family comes first. Uh, and, you know, that was collectively uh, kind of a, a joint decision. And, um, you know, uh, that will that always remind, that stays my kind of number one uh, my number one priority, and I think to to your point in terms of I think COVID actually has been a really good whilst you know a, a hideous thing for for clearly people who've been directly impacted and, and lost loved ones, but I think COVID has also been a really good opportunity to to offer more diversity in the way organisations work and and the way shift patterns and the way we can work, which I think opens up some different uh, different opportunities. Yeah, and I think it just it just is a the for me the point I wanted to to um, bring out there was that um, actually men go through those decision making um, challenges as well around um, doing uh, what you want to do, and that can mean that that families play a part in the decisions you make around your career, which I'm sure is the the case for many. Uh, hugely, yeah, yeah. So so certainly if if I was thinking of you know move to different organisations absolutely been driven by the family so do we want yeah. to move to that? do we not do we not not want to go there yeah absolutely interesting yeah. now you did say that there were two uh, there were a couple of things that you've been really proud of um in your career what what are they what are the you, you mentioned two but what have you been really proud of in your career um so so yeah there's, so big, there's one which sounds it'll probably sound a bit fluffy but it but actually it, it's um it, it, in in my last three roles it's actually culturally been about making sure we bring the customer to the heart of the decision making so how have we listened to our customers 
how do we know what their priorities are and how do we make sure as an organization we are reflecting that in the decisions we make as an organization um, and for me that's been about kind of really shouting for the voice of the customer and for our frontline teams to be honest because it's a really hard job uh, when you're, you're in the CX centre, you're dealing with emails, dealing with, with kind of issues often uh, that someone else in the organisation has created. And so it's about championing that. And so for me, I'm really proud of culturally moving the organisations to reflect that and to, to see our employee engagements improve you know, and, and, and how that directly impacts on, on our satisfaction. Um, I think practically, so I loved uh, the, the online stuff uh, I was doing at BT. And then more recently, um, I'm uh, involved with the Institute of Customer Services as a non-exec director and um, really proud to play a part in, uh, we're, we're in the process of changing the law to protect frontline workers. Uh, and that will be uh, a criminal offence to, uh, to be abusive to frontline workers. That gives the police more statutes to, uh, to, to, to fine and to take through the court process. Uh, and so I sit, I've been, been at the old parliamentary committees where we've been discussing that and that's just going through the justice bill at the moment. So ICS has done a great job, Joe Coulson, managing that to, to really drive it. Uh, and I'm really proud to have been part of that. Yeah. And you know what? I, that, that's one of the things I've been watching and uh, is certainly something that I've been supporting with the ICS as well, because um, I, I think it's so incredibly valuable. Um, and, and actually, if I, it is something I wanted to ask you about, because my background is that I've been involved in boards in um, in marketing uh, on the Trust Institute of Marketing. You've done a similar thing with the Institute of Customer Service and um, being a, a NED on there. Um, how how did you get into that? What um, how did that happen? How did you find yourself um, elected onto the board? So so I'll probably start by by saying I, I was really embarrassed having spent my career in customer services and until about 10 years ago, had never, never come, come across the Institute of Customer Services. So a professional body that I was part of, uh, in fact, I is, you know, worked more closely with kind of the CCMA, yeah. uh, and, uh, and, and that's where I got some of my professional development from. So, um, so when I kind of came across it, um, got involved again from the learning perspective. So a lot of that was about learning from other organisations. I think one of the, you know, the main benefits personally is talking and having access to other organizations in the same same way as CCMA does, where, where you can meet colleagues in different sectors, learn from things they're doing, or sense check where you are again, so I, you know, what are they doing, what am I doing? So so the learning and the access to insight and information was for me the, the, the initial driver. Um, I was then asked would I join as a vice president, so that's um, kind of industry representations from, from different sectors that come together, throw around ideas and, and also help prioritise things for the Institute to, to focus their research on. Um, and it was through being a vice president that uh, I was then successful and, and joined, the, uh, joined the board uh, of, uh, of the organisation. No, that's really good. And you've been there for a few years? Uh, six years. So, yeah, I've got a, another year another year to go for my tenure uh, and uh, learned a huge amount. It's been a, every, every meeting I go to with the Institute, uh, as with CCMA, to be honest, I come away with something new that I go, that's a really great idea. Or actually, could we tweak something we do? Uh, or it's insight just to help on, our, help on the decision making. Uh, and I think, you know, to me, that's, uh, that's, that's been a key part. And, and I think it's also then and involving people through uh, in the organization that then you know the experiences i've had so uh, i have some of my team now kind of directly involved with uh, ccma and and also directly involved with um, ics again so we could just kind of share that learning and share that knowledge no absolutely and I, and I, i'm a big advocate of um and it's one of the reasons why we're doing so much now is because the more opportunities there are for people to get together to learn from each other um it's just going to help elevate the whole industry. Um, so now I'm in total support. Um, I, I've got some quick fire questions for you, but okay. before I go into my quick fire questions, what's next? So you said there you've got um, just one more year um, on the board of the ICS. Do, do you see that being a platform to maybe something else, not necessarily a job changer from Vivid, but looking at other opportunities around where you can continue to um, uh, add value back into the industry or maybe further your your net because arguably it's a net role 
Yeah, that's right. So I'm also a non-exec director for another housing company uh, called Magna, uh, which is down on the uh, the south coast. So for me, um, I, I look at it two ways. One is um, how can I use my professional experience and things I've learned and help work with organisations where it may add value in, in their thinking? And often, whether it's the voice of the customer or and some of those things, or it's that kind of service ethos, uh, 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 frankly. So, so for me, and secondly, I learn from those uh, those roles as well. So again, it gives me another lens, another way to just to keep my insight fresh and up to date. I think um, one thing I'll probably say if I if I go back to to you know if I look kind of through my career, things that I've done, and you know I came through the state school system. Um, did I ever think I would be doing some of the things that I do today? Not at all. So if I was 18 uh, and I look at the things that I've had, you know, had the, the brilliant opportunity to do from being international to 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 doing the old parliamentary committees at, uh, at the House of Parliaments um, to, to some learned roles, uh, I never would have believed I would do those things. And so one of the things I think for me has been really important now actually is working with people as they come through the career. So for the mentors that I've had and actually helping people to see the but to, to see and release the potential they have um often because we don't believe we could do those things and so actually part of what i want to do more of going forward is more of that kind of mentoring support or help just to create create that belief um because mentors have helped me to do that i never thought i would be doing things that i have done uh, over the last sort of 20 25 years well you and i will have another conversation because i'm sure that there's a shed load more ideas um, that, uh, that that we can talk through. Right. So my quick, quick five questions. What's your favourite animal? Ooh, um, I'm going to say something really bizarre now, but sheep. So uh, Jacob's sheep, we uh, we had the opportunity to, to own a few years ago, and um, they have the most wonderful personalities, more than you would ever think. So they're tough, they're hardy little creatures, uh, they've got real personalities, uh and um yeah more, more so i would have said probably a dog but more so than some of your household pets uh, do you know what Re that was really random that was so good <laughs> that was so good um so what's your favorite color uh blue it says we're blue. in battery right. items of blue at the moment so yeah so <laughs> fairly, fairly uh fairly conservative but blue <laughs> yeah no I, I i can say yeah i'm kind of a supporter of blue um What's your favourite season? Spring, because it's it, if you can if you kind of where we are now, you've got that. I love autumn as well, but um, it's that hope. Everything's exploding. Uh, you've got the light nights coming ahead, and you still got summer yet to come. So I think kind of spring is just that whole creation. It's just it's wonderful. I love that. And do you know what? As you said that, and thinking about the hope. Um, almost bringing it full circle back to the very uh, start of our conversation um, was around the opportunity you've got in your role to be able to provide hope and provide support for um, what people are going to go through over the next six, nine months. And which leads me to my last question. What are you most looking forward to? Um, Career-wise, I think it, it's, yeah, I, I would say directly, what can we do? to make a difference in our communities, because I, I have the privilege and the role that, that I do to, to be able to make a difference in the communities that we kind of support. So so how how can we deploy our resources and organisation to support without taking on, you know, individual responsibility for things? So so we've got some things we can do that I think will will support and help. Um, personally, coming out of um, uh, coming out of COVID, I've got some uh, some holidays planned so one with my wife where we're going off together i've got one to go to the grand prix in belgium with my youngest and uh to go and um uh, my eldest son uh, so my my family heritage is from scotland he was born in england so he's going to wear a kilt when we go to the rugby in scotland in uh, in the autumn so um so 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 those are some of the things i'm kind of looking forward to fantastic so travel is back on the cards it is Fantastic. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me um, this morning, this afternoon, um, for, for chatting with us. Fantastic to hear how your career has developed and grown. Um, really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, join me uh, in a couple of weeks' time where we have a new, a, a new guest where I'll be finding out a little bit more about their career. Thank you so much. See you soon. Thank you.